Yeah, my name is Zach Coda. I am a teacher naturalist at North Branch Nature Center, and I love amphibians and reptiles, and I'm particularly in love with salamanders, which is why I'm so glad to be sharing um, some time with you this evening and talking about them and answering your questions as you uh, prepare to go out and uh, help some salamanders across the road. Um, and Sean, I don't know if you mentioned um, that this is, is indeed being recorded as well. Yep, that's right. Um, so yeah, this will be. This is currently being recorded, and uh, and we'll post this to our uh, to our website um, in the next couple of days. Here, um, don't worry. Your faces and you know the dinner you're eating is not going to be part of that uh, recording. <laughs> so let's see. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen over here. It'll have various different things on it. Um, so give me a thumbs up if you can see the new the, the title screen that just uh, I just I just loaded up there in Fabian Road Crossing program. Zach gives me a thumb up, but I, I want to see other other thumbs up as well. Great, I see I see a quorum of thumbs up. That's good. And if you don't see that, you can just open up that the person tab again, and uh, and click on next to my name the one there'll be one that's called presentation, and that'll pop it up for your screen. Um, but uh, let's we'll, we'll we'll get into it. So the way we want to do this tonight is um, Zach is is the Central Vermont expert on all things amphibians, and uh, most of what I've learned about uh, salamanders and frogs um, over the last few years have been entirely from Zach. Um, and so I have lots of questions for Zach that I've organized in in a, uh, in a somewhat organized format, and um, and we'll just go through those. Um, we'll we'll talk about amphibian ecology and kind of uh, really common questions around around what these animals are up to. And we'll also talk about some of the questions around our protocols and how you actually get out and do this survey and some common things that we are are asked um, about. You know, how do I find a site? That kind of stuff. Um, that said, um, as we're going, if you've got a question, um, go ahead and, and pop it into the, um, the the chat bar. You can type it in, or you can um, just unmute yourself and and go ahead and ask. Um, so let's see what we got. So um, Zach, let's uh, start a little bit with um, kind of the phenology, the life cycle of these critters. Um, we are we suddenly it, it is the end of March and we suddenly care about amphibians after not thinking about them for the last three or four months. Um, what have they been doing? I don't know about you. I've been thinking about amphibians all year long. Um, but, yes, you're right that most people don't think about amphibians in the wintertime because we can't see them. And most of the time, they're, they're underground. They are, um, for species like spotted salamanders, they're down um, making their way through small rodent tunnels um, and other passages that are below the frost line, right? They need to be below the frost line um, to survive, and that's where those small rodent tunnels are. Um, for other species like wood frogs, um, they are uh, have a, a special adaptation that allows them to almost freeze solid um, for the winter. So in the fall, when uh, it starts to get cold, these uh, frogs are creating special proteins and special sugars um, inside their cells and the spaces between their cells. Um, and the sugars lower the freezing point and the, the proteins allow uh, ice to form, allow water to freeze in their cells in such a way that when they unthaw, it won't rupture the cells or the organs. Uh, so it's really amazing that they have this controlled freezing mechanism and can become a frogsicle for several months. Um, and they're, they're right underneath the ground, probably buried in the, or, or buried in the leaf litter. Um, and so you're walking over frozen wood frogs all winter long. And then when it warms up, uh, times like this, when we have nice warm rain, melting that snowpack and they're warming up, uh, they'll unthaw and hop right back into life. I have such a vivid memory uh, when I was in Cub Scouts of 
um, uh, starting a campfire um, with some other scouts. We're sitting around the campfire, and and uh, it was must have been February or so, and a wood frog hopped right out of the campfire and uh, and into the snow. Yeah, uh, that is. Um, I've heard other stories of that happening too. Of course, any time where they warm up um, to that, they'll they'll unthaw and and spring back to life. Unfortunately, it it that controlled um, freezing. Uh, has to take place um, not not terribly slowly, but in a very controlled way. And so, uh, if they are suddenly warmed up and then it gets super cold again, they may not be able to freeze um, in in that safe way, and and they could die. So that's one of the concerns with these um, with climate change and the the kind of um, the freeze thaw cycles that are, are happening often is that uh, if they are freezing and thawing too much uh, in the spring, uh, they won't be able to survive. And some species need that that insulating snow layer on top of them that keeps them cold throughout the winter um, and keeps them from thawing out prematurely. Uh, and so that's another concern as we lose our winter snowpack these animals that are adapted for that um, could be in trouble. Um, one thing that that reminded me of too, and maybe we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but uh, folks are often asking, you know, is now a good time to go out looking for amphibians? And sometimes you go out and the conditions seem like they ought to be great, uh, but there's not really a whole lot moving. Um, and even though the snowpack may have left, the ground could still be totally frozen through. And considering that, like you said, a lot of the the salamanders, in particular, are are down under the frost line. You know, according to them, they might they they might not even know what's going on. You know, several feet up above. So, um, so so I guess that that might explain uh, some of the the quiet nights when you might expect otherwise things to be moving. Um, but I guess we can circle back to that a little bit a little sure. bit later. Um, all right. So, well, yeah. This is this is a question that we get a lot, which is you know this this season that we are. Uh, focusing in on this amphibian road crossing project is is fairly short, right? It's it's you know in, in a long season, it's mid March to mid May. Um, so why is it that they're only moving right now? Yeah, they are in a mad dash to get to their breeding sites. So there is a, a lot of competition at these places where the amphibians are breeding, and um, the the gamble that they're taking things like male wood frogs um, want to be the first ones back to their vernal pool because they'll have a better chance of finding a female or multiple females um, and 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 making offspring and passing on their 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 genes and so that's the that's the big rush right now as soon as the conditions are right for them to move they want to be the first ones back to their breeding site and so for some vernal pools, there's, there's been some really interesting studies about this, where something like 95% of the spotted salamanders return to a, a vernal pool over the course of five nights. So there was a stretch of good weather, and they all came back within a few, within a few days. Hmm. Uh, so it happens really quickly. Someone asked in our meeting the other night about, you know, that connection between what if they move too quickly and their pool freezes over or it gets really cold and, and they can't go back into that, that controlled frogsicle. Um, and that's the really fascinating gamble of evolution, right? Some frogs move really early and, and risk, you know, um, perishing if there's bad weather and others move later and might not be the first ones back to the breeding pool, but um, aren't taking such a gamble with the weather. You know, that's, that's actually, you know, reminds me, and I think this actually is our, might be the next question that we have, um, which is, you know, thinking about species diversity at these road crossings and how that's changing over the course of this season. And, and that, um, that cost benefit that you just described, where like, if you get back there too early, your, your vernal pool could freeze back over after you're there. And it seems like some species uh, opt um, some species take a, a greater risk when it comes to um, timing the end of winter 
uh, than others. And so I'm thinking about like Jefferson salamanders in particular walking right across the snowpack to get into you know, what might just be a tiny little hole in the ice in a vernal pool. Do you want to talk a little bit, Zach, about, about um, you know, different species and how they, uh, when, when their peaks are at different times of the, the migration season? Yeah, sure. Um, we're also in an interesting place in Vermont where we're at the intersection of a few different uh, ranges of amphibians. So, you know, we're, we're well within the wood frog, frog, you know, range across the northeast, but we're, you know, sort of at a limit in terms of blue-spotted salam salamander range. Uh, and so some of these uh, species... Um, where we're kind of at, at, at the, the northern end of their range um, are, are going to migrate uh, a little bit earlier versus the other ones. Um, and here you can kind of see that um, this is looking at when frogs are calling, but the first frogs that we have moving are, are wood frogs and spring peepers. Uh, and then a little bit later in the season, you have American toads, um, and then a little bit later, even than that, are gray tree frogs that are moving. And those are, uh, are the later moving species are species that, un unlike wood frogs and spring peepers, are, are uh, finding places to get away from the cold in the winter rather than freezing solid. The advantages of the wood frog um, is that it's right, usually right underneath the leaf litter um, uh, on the forest floor when it freezes. So those first warm days, as soon as that wood frog thaws out, it's ready to move. It doesn't have to find its way up above ground again, um, like the, the later moving frogs might. Uh, and so you get these, this um, interesting pattern of wood frogs and peepers, uh, and they'll, go for, they'll be migrating for a while. Wood frogs might be migrating uh, into April. Uh, and then there are almost no wood frogs, then you'll start to get toads moving, and then you'll start to get tree frogs moving later. And then, like halfway through the tree frog migration, you may get wood frogs again that have already completed their, um, their, their breeding and are now moving back out into the forest. So as you're seeing tree frogs now moving towards breeding sites, um, you can get wood frogs, you're seeing them for the second time in the season, but now they're moving the opposite direction back into the forest away from that breeding site. Mm -hmm. And when we're looking at that kind of return migration back to the forest, that's not necessarily as, as um, intensive a pulse of movement like there is on the, on the front end of the migration season like we're expecting in the next, you know, this next couple of weeks. Is that, is that the case? Yeah, they're not they're not in so much of a rush when they're when they're leaving their breeding site. The big rush is to be the first one to the breeding site to make sure you find a partner uh, and can mate. Uh, it's not so much of a rush to get um, out of that breeding pool and back into the forest. And for some species, that may may take you know you may have spotted salamanders that hang out in the area of a vernal pool after they've mated for for weeks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Just, uh, let's see, I want to see if we can incorporate a little bit of uh, technology here. I was going to see if we could find that, that video of the spotted salamanders that are um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the vernal pool. You know the one I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll see if I can find that. But meanwhile, I have another question for you, actually, sure. um, which is, oh, yeah. Um, so, so I know there's some um, reptiles that will actually spend the winter, the winter underwater, um, hibernating essentially underwater. I'm wondering if any of our amphibians do that as well. Yeah, so um, a lot of our water frogs um, do that. Uh, species like bullfrogs, uh, green frogs will, you know, spend the winter uh, down underneath um, in, the, in the mud at the bottom of a lake or a pond or a wetland that, that stays um, that stays fluid throughout the winter. So you may have a pond where they're, oh, here's our spotted salamanders. Um, I'll talk for just a moment while the video is playing about what's happening here. You can see a congregation, a congress of spotted salamanders. They're doing this amazing dance where they're interweaving um, and they're, they're competing for mates. 
you can see there's um, little white dots on the bottom of the uh, pool. Those are called spermatophores. Those are little packets of sperm that the male uh, spotted salamanders are laying down um, on the bottom of the pool, and then they're guiding the female to their spermatophore, um, hoping that she'll pick that up and use it to fertilize her eggs. Um, and then you're, you're seeing also um, the spotted salamander swimming up to get a gulp of air and then uh, swimming back down to the group. Hmm. Um, cool. So, so another question we get a lot is, um, how are our amphibians doing here in Vermont? There is, you know, worldwide, there's a major decline in amphibian populations, especially in tropical regions, um, fungal infections and, and other um, pathogens um, really decimating, um, and then some. A lot of the amphibian populations, there's been species extinctions. Others are at the brink, something like maybe 30%. Am I remembering right that maybe around 30% of amphibian species are, are endangered or critically endangered at this point? Um, how does that map onto the Vermont amphibian population? Yeah, it's definitely a concern. Um, we are losing amphibians um, we're, we're to extinction at a much higher rate than, than any other group of organisms. Amphibians are really having a hard time right now. One of the reasons is that, that they are uh, uniquely adapted in absorbing things through their skin. So they um, are, much, have, are much more susceptible to environmental pollution, but also things, pathogens uh, like fungal infections, which are a, a big thing we're seeing. Um, and it also means that they're really susceptible to climate change. Uh, as uh, areas get hotter and drier, amphibians uh, can't really handle that. So they're forced to e either move their ranges, which um, uh, is easier done if you have big long legs for walking or, or wings for flying. But for amphibians, just moving to where the climate is, uh, is better for you isn't, isn't possible. Uh, so in Vermont, we, we've seen the loss of species, um, of one species in particular, the boreal chorus frog, um, due to due, uh, perhaps to climate change. This was a frog, um, the boreal chorus frog, uh, related uh, and similar <laughs> to spring peeper. Um, and they, they at one point, um, we were at sort of the, the southern end of their range, but they um, existed in the northwest part of Vermont, so think of like Grand Isle and Franklin counties. Um, and it's a, another frog like spring peeper that uh, in the winter time they they freeze solid and are underneath the snowpack. Um, unfortunately, that low lying area of Vermont is one that has lost its winter snowpack as we've warmed. Uh, that area of Vermont does not get nearly as much snow and, and is losing its snowpack faster than other areas of Vermont. And so that snow that needs to keep those frogs insulated so that they can get through the whole winter um, has disappeared. And so that frog has, has, for the most part, disappeared for Vermont. I don't think it's been recorded in over a decade um, in Vermont. Uh, although they they still exist not far from here in Ontario, so in, in the lower areas of Ontario, like in the Cornwall area. In fact, um, uh, I have to uh, thank Jim Andrews at the Vermont Herp Atlas for teaching me most of what I know, but also doing a tremendous amount of research over decades in, in, in reptiles and amphibians in Vermont. Um, and he was just uh, passed on that they um, reported hearing boreal chorus frogs chorusing um, over in Cornwall, Ontario area. So they still exist not too far away, and it's possible that there could be a, a population out there in northwestern Vermont that has eluded um, surveyors, um, but as far as we know, they, they've disappeared um, from the state. Other amphibians in Vermont um, may be stressed uh, due to uh, vernal pools, so there's been a lot of stress on vernal pools lately, particularly as we continue to develop more rural parts of our state. Um, uh, vernal pools are being threatened, so we're not, we're not seeing um, 
sal- uh, like spotted salamander declines to the point where we're concerned about them overall. But as we put more stress on road crossings and, and vernal pools, um, we're seeing overall numbers in some of these more common species decline. Zach, I got a great question. Sure. About our frozen frog. And yeah. This is from Elena. Um, when a frog wakes up from hibernation, do you think it feels like months have passed, or does it feel like they just fell asleep moments ago? Ah, uh, boy, that's a great question. I wonder what a wood frog thinks when it wakes up from a long winter nap. I wonder if it recognizes the place it went to sleep in. Um, you would have to, uh, uh, Elena, you'd have to ask a wood frog. I, I encourage you, when you go out there tonight, find a wood frog and uh, whisper your question into an, its ear and, and see what it says in reply. And let me know. <laughs> I'll be curious too. Um, so, so um, you know, again, for folks that have joined us since we started, I want to invite you, if you have any questions at all, you're welcome to um, ask them either by um, just typing your question into the, uh, the chat bar, or you can unmute yourself and ask your question and re-mute yourself um, at any point, so feel free to jump in. Um, we're going to transition from some of our questions related to um, amphibian ecology and towards some of our questions around the methodologies that we use and some of the questions um, for uh, how to go about doing doing this project. Um, uh, ben just posted a Couple, well, a couple of links to check out that were just posted in our in our chat here. One for boreal chorus frog, uh, iNatural Century. That uh, will I'll check out uh, here in a moment. Um, and then um, Zach, you just posted something about uh, was yeah, that too as well? Yeah, boreal chorus frog as well. So thanks, Ben, for posting that iNaturalist link, so you can see sort of where boreal chorus frogs live now. Um, and you can also uh, learn more about boreal chorus frogs in Vermont um, in particular. Let's see if we can <laughs> pull it up. Yeah. Um, so if you can see, hopefully you can see that screen transition. This is, this is actually, so um, this is uh, showing very clearly that, that really amazing um, kind of population break right you can see right up in the northwest corner of Vermont. Um, anyway, yeah, what Zach was saying about that population in Ontario, this um, this this range map of the uh, of the, the chorus frog is um, it's really fascinating. I would also just throw in another plug for iNaturalist in general as a way to answer a lot of your questions about um, what species is this, where does it belong, where is what's it doing. Um, it's a great resource for um, for all things natural history. Um, cool. So, um, yeah, again, feel free to throw in any other questions that you have or unmute yourself, ask it and, and re-mute. Um, we'll, we'll transition a little bit. Um, I, a lot of folks are asking us, um, what's the story with um, COVID-19 as it pertains to our our project and the amphibian road crossing project, <clears throat> and and I guess I'll I'll put in my two cents, and then Zach, you can feel free to to um, add add anything that you'd like to as well. Um, you know, from our perspective, this is a wonderful activity to do at a time where we are all having to keep our distance from one another, um, and uh, you know a lot of um, this this project is you know it takes place in remote places or I should say you know in quiet back roads it takes place um, you know at night when there's not really a lot of traffic on the roads um, it it's it's an activity that is really perfect for um, for a socially uh, distance physically distance um, uh, you know moment with nature and um, and so we we think it's it's a really great thing to do, um, but it's really important that everybody stays safe and uses their best judgment in participating. And so so some really important considerations. Well, some of these considerations are really important whether or not we were in this particular moment um, in history. Um, just general safety is, is so important. You know, we are we are when we're out there doing this. We're in the dark, in the rain. Um, and that's a time where it's always going to be difficult for motorists to see what we're doing out there. And so we want to make um, extremely careful that we are 
wearing our bright reflective vests. I don't know if you could see me uh, through the curtain over there, but I'm wearing my reflective vest. I never, you know, I never go anywhere without it. <laughs> um, and uh, so wear reflective vests, um, use bright flashlights. Anytime you see a car, uh, a car's headlights, even if they're way in the distance, um, step off the road immediately. It can be hard to, to judge distance of cars in the dark, but step way off the road so that there's no chance of, the, of that motorist being spooked by your presence. Um, and definitely put your safety first. Um, one other piece that that uh, that I I'd add, um, you know, that is particularly important to to take note of is, um, you know, we're also driving on soft, muddy roads oftentimes um, when we're doing this project, and so you want to make sure that you are not driving your car into a mud pit that you will get stuck in, uh, because the last thing you want in this particular moment in time is to have to rely on somebody else to uh, to come and get you. Um, so, so just be really, uh, be really, you know, wise and, and think carefully about um, about your safety and, and how you're being as safe as possible when you're doing this. Um, but um, with those considerations, again, we'd say use your best judgment, and um, and we feel this is a way to to really get some some good exercise in uh, in quiet places. Um, Zach, anything else you want to add about that? Uh, I will second everything Sean just said about safety, and just add that. Um, this project is some really great nature therapy in a time when it feels like all of our lives have slowed way down. Um, these amphibian lives are just ramping up and it's amazing to go out there and see that even though things feel really chaotic um, for us, that for the amphibians, it is, it's just another year, and uh, you, know, you can count on them to be out and about um, regardless of what's going on for us. And, and I uh, take great comfort in knowing that the great cycles of nature continue regardless. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, these, these FAQs here that we're going to go through are not in any particular order necessarily, but they're all questions that we get a lot. And um, one of them is, do I submit survey data even if I don't see anything out there? And it's amazing how after every uh, migration crossing, I get, you know, uh, dozens of emails about everybody saying how great of a time they had. And then I look at the data sheets, or I look at our, our data submission, and I see, oh, there's a lot of folks that didn't actually submit any of their data. Um, you know, of course, if you if you see amphibians, you know you you're you're going to want to submit that data. But even if you don't, even if you go out and you don't see anything, it's really important you still submit data to us um, because um, we need to know if sites are not active. A lot of our sites that we have are prospective sites. They're sites that we have determined to be um, a likely spot for amphibian migration, but we just don't know. And so the only way that we can know. Um, if a site is active or not is is if we have your if, if we have the data saying that yeah you were out there you know you did your surveys um, and, and you know at this day at this time in these conditions and we didn't see anything and the other th important reason to um, to uh, make sure you submit our data is that we can know who is out there um, supporting this project and we have a good idea of how many of you and how many hours have been spent um, you know with the amphibians and, and with this project so um, please please do submit Zach. Well, I'll, I'll add, uh, I'll second that um, even even data that um, show there aren't anything crossing on a certain night are really important. Um, we make all of all of our data available uh, to local and regional planners so that they can see where there might be conflicts with transportation. So there, you know, areas where. Uh, lots of amphibians are crossing the road, and there's also lots of traffic, which is why we ask people to also collect tra traffic data. Um, again, traffic this year is probably a little bit less than traffic in, in most years, um, but that allows people to see where those conflicts exist between traffic and, um, and wildlife. Uh, it also is really interesting to be able to see um, that progression uh, northward as sites in the Champlain Valley may be moving sooner, um, sites in the more northeast part of the state are moving later. So going out and surveying perhaps um, a night where you don't have any movement and then trying again a week later or two weeks later um, when there 
there are better conditions uh, allows us to really fine tune our guesses about when things are going to move and what conditions have to be like in different parts of the state. Yeah, Zach, this would be a good time to to um, answer. Um, so, so people are asking some questions in the chat feed, and um, and you know, it's it's worth reiterating this a, f a few times because this is perhaps the most common question we get, and we'll we'll encounter it here in a little bit. Um, but we can we can address it now because it, it speaks to your point. Um, folks are always asking, are amphibians going to move in my backyard tonight? Um, and, and, you know, they ask us for a, a forecast of, you know, is, are things going to be moving here or there? Um, and, you know, we're, we're very pleased to say that we have volunteers all over the state now, which is wonderful, but it makes it really difficult for us to be able to actually give a migration forecast that applies to everybody. Um, and so um, what we need to remember and it's, it's very easy to, to create your own migration forecast by looking out the window and asking yourself some very simple questions. Um, is it dark? Is it raining? And is it at least 40 degrees Fahrenheit? And, um, and I guess you could also throw in, is it, you know, is it this time of year? Is it late March through the early May? Now, if it's dark, raining, and above 40, the answer is probably going to be yes, there's going to be movement. Um, if those three conditions are not, if any of those three conditions are not met, if it's not dark yet, if it's in the 30s or below, um, and if it's not raining, there's probably not going to be much movement. Now, when you're right on the edge of, of being able to answer yes or no, like, oh, well, it's 39 degrees and it just stopped raining like an hour ago, right? So then, you know, when you're on the line there, you know, there might be a little bit of movement, but but hard to tell. Like tonight in our area, in Montpelier, at least, it's 37 degrees right now and it's raining. It's a little bit cold for there to be a lot of movement, but I'm going to go out looking anyway because there might be a little bit on the move. Um, Zach, did you want to add anything else to that? Yeah. Um, the other factor that is even harder to qualify is the snow melt. Um, now, some of these amphibians will move across the snow, um, uh, but I've definitely had places where even in the same town, um, it depends a lot of ge on geography, whether or not there is still, um, still too much snow uh, for amphibians to be out and moving. Uh, think, um, for example, if there's a wood frog that is on a south-facing slope that gets a lot of, uh, a lot of sun, um, that could be snow-free weeks before um, a wood frog only a mile away that is in a low protected cold pocket that gets a lot of snow. Uh, so uh, it's helpful to have a good idea about um, if you're going to a site, uh, just having a rough idea of is there still a ton of snow there. If there's a lot of snow still on the ground, there might not be big movement until some of that snow melts, although it's true that both spotted salamanders and wood frogs have no problem hopping in and clambering over snow to get to a vernal pool. Thanks, Zach. We can, uh, we can hit that a little bit more a little bit later on. Folks are asking a lot of really good questions, and, and um, I'm pleased to say that most of these we anticipated. So, um, so uh, let's see. So, um, so Ben, Jay, Lisa, Kevin, all just asked some great questions. I think we're going to answer them all here. Um, so, so stay stay tuned a little bit. Um, so one question that we get a lot is, can I combine the whole night's effort into one data submission? And so, um, you know, f first I'll, I'll back up and say that um, for w when folks are going out to do these surveys, we ask that everybody read our volunteer manual. First, um, we've, we've worked hard to make it as simple and easy to read as possible. We've worked really hard to make our methods and protocols as straightforward and streamlined as we possibly can um, because we realize that, you know, everybody's doing this because we want to we want to see the salamanders and frogs. We want to have, um, you know, up close encounters with this really amazing charismatic wildlife. Um, but, uh, but it's also really important to be able to collect some scientifically rigorous data in the process so we can actually do our part to conserve these animals in the long term, um, not just move them out of the, out of the way of car tires. Um, so so um, getting at this question, can I combine the whole night's effort into one data submission? Um, uh, Kev this actually also answers uh, Kevin's question. 
um, which is if we scout a road and do an informal count on a non-peak night, do we still want anecdotal data? And so um, what we would say is um, make sure that you're submitting the data according to the protocol. So, and by that I mean um, when you've picked a crossing site, you know, you want to start at one end of the crossing site, which is where your car is going to be parked, and you um, walk all the way to the other end of the transect. And um, you're, you're moving salamanders off the road along the way. Any dead salamanders and frogs that you encounter, you move them off the road. You're collecting the data according to our protocols. Um, when you get to the end of that transect and you turn around to walk back to your car, you start a, a new survey. That's a new, a new piece of paper, a new data sheet, a new submission. Um, so we don't want folks combining the way out and the way back on the same data sheet. Uh, we don't want folks combining their entire four-hour night um, onto the same submission. Um, we, it's, it's really important that, um, that each row in our data sheet or, you know, in our database is, you know, one per, is a team's one-way pass along their transect. And so, um, so to directly answer um, Kevin's question, um, you know, if you're scouting a road, and you do an informal count on non-peak night, do we still want anecdotal data? I would say if you're if you're scouting a road and it's one of our survey sites, just do that. Just do like a, a one-way full count and uh, and treat it as you would um, a normal survey. You know, there's no need to go back and forth and back and forth um, across the site multiple times. You know, you can just do you know one pass on it and and call it good. If you're not seeing anything, that's fine. But if you do submit um, data to us using are using the status sheet using our online submission form. Um, just please make sure that you're submitting it according to the protocols, um, because it can really skew our our results if um, if one person is you know submitting nine passes on their transect site um, and uh, and they put it all on, on one form. Similarly, if somebody is surveying a site that's nearby but not actually at one of our survey sites, then it's it's not helpful actually to um, to submit data um, for for a site that's actually not one of our, our crossing sites. Now, if you find a good crossing site that isn't one of the ones that we know about, um, then there's actually a, a link on our website that you can report exactly where that is, and we'll add it to our database. Um, a lot of the, the crossing sites that we know about, we know about because of, of folks like you all um, contributing that that new new knowledge. Um, Zach, did you want to say anything else about, um, about that? It may help people to just understand a little bit of why we're asking folks to do each transect separately. One of the things that we're that these data might be used for are for transportation planners to know when um, some communities may close a section of a road if it's a really busy night and they know there's an area where lots of amphibians cross the road. If you're surveying for a couple hours, um, traffic might also decrease with that. So by counting cars, we're able to see are a lot of amphibians being hit on the road during a certain time frame when there's also a lot of cars, which might allow people in that community to figure out a way to have an alternative, um, a, an alternative traffic path that bypasses that area maybe during peak traffic hours. So that's one of the questions, one of the things we can help communities figure out but only if our data are collected in a very specific way. Um, yeah, thanks, Zach. That's a great clarification. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Chris asked a, a great question, um, which um, we uh, we should we should um, jump in on, which is when you mentioned that it needs to be dark, does the time matter too? For example, is 10 o'clock better than 8 o'clock? Um, if it does matter, what time is ideal, or what time do you do you recommend, or what time do we go out looking for amphibians? So, um, so I, you know, if it, they there, it, it's really weather dependent. Um, if it's if the time that it's raining and above forty is like right after dark, then that's when things are going to be moving. Um, you know, often things will be moving throughout the night. Um, you know, stuff is often if if it's raining and dark and above forty, things will be moving shortly after it is it is dark dark. So. Um, going out at you know seven thirty eight o'clock. Um, well, I'm gonna look out the window here. Yeah, going out at seven thirty eight o'clock um, should be um, productive. Um, and uh, you know I'm thinking about last year too, where the in, in our region at least 
um, there was never quite this intersection where it was above 40 degrees um, and raining when it wasn't like two o'clock in the morning. And so most people um, totally missed, um, including myself, missed the kind of the big nights of movement because it was, uh, it was always a little bit too late. You're welcome to survey anytime you want at night. Some folks stay out till you know, 11, 12, one o'clock in the morning, but um, many others of us are more fair weather amphibian friends and, uh, and go out you know, from eight to 10 or something like that. I'm going to um, provide some information to answer Maya's question about mm -hmm. road closures, and I'm going to post a link to answer Maya's question um, in uh, the chat box. Okay, great. Um, okay, another common question we get, is it okay to double count amphibians? Um, so this, this actually gets at some of the questions that folks have about handling the amphibians as well. So we want to try to avoid double counting amphibians as much as we can so that, you know, if you're going out and you know, if you're doing your, your transect one direction, when you come back, you're not double counting that same spotted salamander. And so um, generally, if, if the animal is in the middle of the road and not moving, um, then you pick it up with your hand and you move it. And we'll talk a little bit more about, about um, how to do that. But you'll move it off of the road um, in the direction that it was going. So they're usually pointing in the direction that they want to be moving anyway. And so if we pick them up and move them off entirely off of the road in the direction that they're, we're going, that's the best way to minimize the amount of double counting that happens. And likewise, um, removing dead amphibians from the road keeps folks from double counting those as well. So please don't double count if you can avoid it. Um, we get a lot of questions of, you know, what species is this? And uh, what am I looking at? Now, we don't expect all of our volunteers to be um, uh, expert herpetologists. You know, it's, it's quite easy to identify a spotted salamander, but some of the other um, creatures that we encounter might be harder to identify. And so on our website, on the Amphibian Conservation website, there's a photo submission portal that you can, um, you can submit any photos to that you'd like, and your, your name will be attached to the photo when you submit it. So if you come across something that you're not sure of, then you can just make a note of that in the additional comments on the data sheet and take a picture and upload that, and then we'll be able to connect the dots for you and tell you what it was that you saw. So that's the best way to, to, uh, to handle unknown species is just try to get a picture of it in the field if you can. Um, a lot of folks ask me, how do I, where, where do I go to, to learn about all of this? Is there a manual that has all this um, important protocol and knowledge? And indeed, there is a manual for, for all of this, and it's, it's right on our Amphibian Road Crossing website. Um, I'll pop it up here in a moment so you can see where that is. But we want to make sure that everybody is, is taking a glance. Well, more than that, everybody is thoroughly reading with a cup of tea our, uh, our volunteer manual. Um, before going out to make sure that um, folks are doing it correctly and doing it safely, uh, importantly. Um, so we talked about our amphibians going to move tonight, um, right? That, uh, you know, that idea of if it's raining, it's dark, and it's at least 40 degrees, and the, the, the landscape around you isn't frozen, um, then things will probably be moving. Let's get on to this question of, are we harming the amphibians by doing this? And this will be a way that we can address. Um, Lisa had this question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Lisa's question. Um, Jeff, do you want to take this? Yeah, I'm happy to take this question. Uh, so um, there are some uh, risks to amphibians um, at crossing sites. And so we want to take care that we are um, being as safe as possible for these animals and we're not hurting them while we're trying to help them. So um, one of the big things is we, we want to be really gentle when we're handling amphibian, amphibians. We don't want to, you know, squeeze them, but we also want to be firm so that we don't drop them. Um, and when we're going to carry amphibians, I um, have a, a cooler that I use, so um, it, it's uh, just a, a you know a, a cooler with a handle that I can put salamanders or frogs into. It has a lid. Um, that way, if I have multiple different frogs or salamanders, I can carry them across the road safely all at once. Um, and if you're going to carry them individually, um, it, it's not the greatest for your for your body mechanics, but you can um, kind of keep low, bend down and carry them low to the ground so that 
um, if they were to, to slip out of your hand, that they're, they're not falling very far. Um, they, uh, amphibians, some amphibians can get a little bit slimy. Um, they may secrete mucus um, when they're stressed, so you, you, may, you may lose your grip just a little bit, and you want to be prepared for that. Um, we want to make sure they get fully off the road as well. We're not just leaving them right at the side of the road, but it's, it's helpful to get them all the way off of the road and down maybe into a ditch or, um, or down the hill um, wherever that amphibian is moving toward. Um, and then when we're going to be touching them, you notice that I think the person in the video Sean's about to show is wearing gloves. Um, you can wear gloves. You don't have to wear gloves. If you're choosing not to wear gloves, it's a great idea to wash your hands really well um, and then rinse them really well before handling amphibians. Like I said earlier, they absorb things really easily through the, their skin. So if you have any lotion or chemicals um, on, your, on your hands, they will absorb those as well. So you want to make sure your hands are, are really clean. You want to make sure they're a little bit a little bit wet too, or at least damp, um, because they absorb moisture through their skin. If your hands are dry, you can actually suck moisture out of the amphibians. Um, and so just, you know, holding your hands out in the rain or running them through some wet grass um, can help get your hands moist um, for, and keeping the amphibians uh, healthy. Um, the, other, the other part, and we brought this up about um, fungal infections um, in amphibians is that um, to reduce the potential spread of a, um, a, a, a pathogen between different populations of amphibians, if you go from one site and then are going to move to a different uh, road crossing site, it's probably a good idea to wash your hands in between handling amphibians at two different sites. Uh, there could be a, a fungal pathogen or, or, or a germ um, that is in one population, and you don't want to be responsible for spreading that to another uh, population. Let me go ahead and play this video here, and we can uh, see some, some good technique here. The pickup, the glove, the low bent posture, moving entirely off the road in the direction it was going, and we're noticing that we're gonna, she's going to put it on the opposite side of the snowbank here, right? Um, Amphibians can have a really hard time getting up and over steep slopes. Um, and the other thing is that the snowbank is just jammed full of, uh, of road salt from the winter. And so to just give it a hand, we're going to put it on the opposite side of that snowbank um, over in the woods. Um, we'll play it one more time. You'll see our volunteer here is also wearing a nice headlamp, um, fairly reflective clothing. Do check the uh, the tire the uh, tire marks and the and the puddles and and uh, you know the places where water collects in the road are often places where uh, amphibians are kind of hiding out. Um, like this salamander was right in the the rut of one of the tires. And you know it's it's you know worth mentioning too that um, you know this is we are. Um, when we're handling them, we're not handling them for the sake of, of seeing them up close and putting them right in our faces. We're handling them to try to protect them, right? Um, we are trying to get them out of the way of car tires, um, and we're trying to um, you know, participate in this conservation project as well, so we're getting good quality data. And so if an, if an amphibian is, is trundling its way across the road just fine, um, then there's no need to pick it up and move it if it's on, if it's, on its way. Only pick them up if... Um, if, if it needs to be done, if they're not moving on their own. Um, Jay had asked a question about assigning sites, and I think we talked about this a little bit, that, you know, the, the site is really um, up to you where you want to go. We have a wonderful map on our website um, that shows places that we um, have found amphibians on the move or guess that amphibians could be on the move. Um, but that's really up to you to look around and, and see what kind of, uh, you know, if there are spots in your area that you'd like to survey, which is different than what our volunteers were used to in the past. So if you volunteered with us before, you've claimed a site 
Um, and now we're, we're leaving it up to you folks to decide where you'd like to go and survey. Sean, you're, you're muted. Thank you, the dogs are barking in the background. I forgot to unmute myself. Um, so I wanted to, to take a moment to, um, to show folks how to access this stuff on our website. Again, this is all in the, the volunteer manual, but, um, but sometimes it's great to see it um, live as well. So this is our amphibian conservation uh, site, northbranchnaturecenter.org slash amphibian hyphen conservation. Um, it's under our citizen science tab. And all, everything that you need as a volunteer exists in this panel here on the right. So we have all the resources and the ways in which you're going to be interacting with the protocols. And now we have these new training videos up here as well that will walk you through some, uh, a lot about the project, about amphibian ecology in general, the different species we might see, and then, and then kind of a video tutorial on, on the methods. But um, I'll point out here that um, uh, when it comes time to pick a site that you want to do, um, you go over to our amphibian crossing map. And that'll pop up a, um, this great interactive map that we've produced um, where you can see sites from all over Vermont that we know about. Now, any site that is red is a site that we don't have any data for. It's a site that, based on the aerial imagery, we suspect might have amphibian movement there, but we just don't know. Um, yellow sites are sites that have only been visited a couple of times by volunteers, and so we want uh, more data there. And then green sites are sites that have at least six surveys that have been done. And so particularly for like families that are going out with kids that want to have a site that is going to be a little bit more reliable and, and uh, definitive, um, you can start perusing these green sites here. Um, so what happens is if you zoom in on a particular site in your area, and you can up in the corner here, you can type your address or a road name so you can kind of zoom in on a particular spot. But let's say uh, we go over over here uh, to this site, when you get close enough in the map, you'll see a purple line pop up, and that's the exact start and end of the transect. So that's the exact spot that you're going to walk. So you'll park on one side, and remember, you don't want to drive through your transect because you might squish salamanders. So pick which side you're going to access things from. Park at one side. You're going to walk to the other end of the transect. Um, uh, and then you're going to turn around, start a new data sheet, and walk your way back. Now, to help you with this, and to help you pick a site, uh, if you click on the dot, it'll pop up a, well, a little pop-up here that'll give you all sorts of information about what was seen, what's been found at this site. So at this site, um, uh, off of East Hill Road, um, at the bottom there's a site description that says exactly where the site starts and stops. There's even a little latitude longitude um, of kind of the center point of the site. But you can see um, what volunteers have been really active at that site, how many surveys have been done there, how many species have been encountered. This site has had 690 total amphibians encountered, six different species. Um, it tells you a little bit about the traffic, which can be really helpful for families as well if, they're, if they want to know if they're going to a site that's going to be really um, can have a lot of traffic or not. And, um, and it even shows you the different species that have been encountered at this site. So spotted salamander, eastern redback salamander, eastern newt, wood frog, spring peeper. And, uh, and one thing that Zach and I have been doing this last year is creating this interactive map here so that when you submit your data through our uh, data submission form, um, this information gets automatically put right into our database, and then this map automatically grabs that information. And so this is all happening more or less in real time. There's a little bit of a delay. Um, but your, your contributions um, in the form of, of this data um, will automatically be updating this map within just a couple hours. Um, so you can use this map and explore this to try to figure out whether you want to go to a site that is totally unknown and you want to see if you can find a new population or go to a site that we need more data on, or go to a site that's a little bit more reliable. So again, click on those dots, and it'll, it'll pop up a lot more um, information about each one of those sites. Um, and, our, uh, yeah, Zach? Yeah, and to go back to the question that Kevin had asked earlier about what if I you know, see amphibians crossing the road in a, in a place that's not on the map yet, um, there is a link. Uh, down below, a little bit further down uh, Sean's screen, 
that is um, to report a new amphibian road crossing. And so if you find a place where amphibians are crossing a road that we don't know about yet, we can add that to our map um, fairly easily. So please report um, places where lots of amphibians are crossing the road um, so that we can get that on the map and other people can go survey it. Super. Um, and if you're not receiving our emails, although you probably are since you're here, um, you can sign up um, to our, our amphibian road crossing email list with a button right above that too. Um, so let's see. Um, I'm going to just take a peek through the rest of our chat bar here and see if we've hit all the questions. Um, but I will also just encourage you all to spend some time with our site and with these resources so that you're prepared and ready to go um, when you do head out. Um, Okay, so Ben's asking what a regular night of monitoring looks like um, for the most intense volunteers. So, um, so some some sites. Let's let's talk about um, some dedicated volunteers at at fairly busy sites. Um, folks might choose to be out there for five or six hours. I'm not saying you have to, um, but some folks will actually you know commit several hours. Um, doing transects of their site back and forth and back and forth, moving um, amphibians off the road. Um, and uh, I would say most folks do typically one or two sites a night. Um, so it's not that folks are driving all over the state hitting all these different things. We'd recommend that folks spend more time at fewer sites if, uh, if they have the choice. Um, but it can be, you know, on really busy sites, it can be challenging to um, be moving all these amphibians off the road and keeping track of all this data. And, um, and, uh, and so we ask you to do your best. And if you feel that you have, um, that you want to keep helping out with the amphibians and moving them, but you just don't really have the wherewithal to be collecting data anymore, then we ask that it, it's totally fine to, to do some passes on your site where you just, you know, you don't, Count it at all. Just you know, pretend you're not collecting data at all. If you do a few, um, you know, a few surveys for us um, at a site on a night, and you want to just keep going, um, you know, we would rather you just kind of take a break from collecting data than to be uh, haphazard about doing so. Um, not, Zach, I'm not sure how clear I just was in explaining that. So maybe you can just do damage control on what I explained. Yeah. Well, uh <laughs> You know, it wasn't too bad, but, um, you know, Sean is saying that the data collection effort in this, we tried to make it as simple and as easy as possible, but it is some work to keep track of cars and amphibians and things, especially on a night where there may be hundreds of salamanders and frogs crossing the road. Um, and if you're by yourself collecting data and moving things at the same time, maybe a lot of work. And so if you're feeling a little burnt out from having to write everything down, you might do um, one or two passes of the transect where you collect really good data for, that, for us. But after that, if you feel like um, recording the data is too much and you just want to have a leisurely pass where you focus on helping amphibians across the road, um, that's okay. We would love as much data as you can give us, but we understand that um, data collection is work. And we, we appreciate you all doing that work. Um, so with that, I guess we'll, we'll just reiterate the, you know, one other question we've been getting um, kind of peppered throughout is, you know, should I go out tonight? Should I go out looking for uh, frogs and salamanders tonight? And, and again, we'll say use your own judgment with the knowledge you now have. If it is uh, raining um, in your area and if it is, you know, hovering around that 40 degree mark, then, you know, give it a shot. Zach and I will we'll, we'll be out tonight. We're not expecting a, a, a huge night of movement because the temperatures are still pretty, pretty chilly. They're on the lower end of what they'll move in. But hey, we might see a couple of salamanders. We might see a couple of wood frogs. So, um, so we'll give it a shot. But I think that our, our biggest nights of movement are definitely still ahead of us. Um, unless you're like way down in like New Haven or like the you know southern part of the Champlain Valley, somewhere really warm in the state. But for most of us, big movement is still ahead of us. Um, any final questions from anybody or any final thoughts from Zach? Going once. Going twice. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you, everybody. We really appreciate your support of this project. The amphibians thank you as well.
Um, Zach, would you like the last word? Just and just to say, if questions pop up as you're out there doing survey or you know, surveys, or if you get lingering questions afterwards, feel free to to send us an email, and we'll, we'll we're happy to get back to you or or share resources that we're aware of. And and thanks again for getting out there and, and helping amphibians. All right, super. Thanks everybody. Have a great evening. Good luck. <laughs>